Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Center Church. Uh, happy Independence Day. Now, I know that Independence Day was actually yesterday, but the 4th of July, but we celebrate for the whole weekend, don't we? And this is our Independence Day uh, worship service. You know, I, I have like the best mask for that, and I want to thank Kaylee, De uh, Kaylee for that. I'm sorry. It's not Decker anymore. <laughs> but I want to thank Kaylee for it. When she, and thank her for providing all the masks that you see out there. And uh, when she first brought them into the office, uh, I, I was looking through them and I saw this and I said, I got to have that one. <laughs> it's great any day, but especially uh, for, for today. And we are indeed uh, glad that you're here as we've gathered in God's house to, to worship him and, uh, and give him the glory and praise that he is due. You know, Independence Day is about celebrating uh, the day in which, in 1776, our forefathers declared independence from, from Britain. So it's a celebration of freedom. But we celebrate an even greater freedom in Christ. It talks about this in Galatians 5, where it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Christ has set us free from sin as we put our faith and trust in him. And so often, you know, we struggle. I mean, on the one hand, we're made new in Christ, and we're living out that new life, that freedom that's ours in Christ. On the other hand, we live in this body, this flesh that is prone to sin and, 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 and fleshly desires. And so it's a, it's a struggle for us. Uh, we sometimes fall back into that yoke of slavery, but he has set us free. Paul goes on to write in verses 13 and 14, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, made to be free in Christ, called to be free, to live free in him. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. It's interesting, isn't it? The world looks at servitude very differently than the way God looks at it. Christ came not to be served, but to serve. And in doing so, to be a an example for us to follow. That's what we are to do, to love one another. That's what he said. This is my command, that you love one another. And so we've been called to serve, and we find freedom in that service. Really, according to, uh, to Scripture, we're either a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. There's no middle ground. The problem is so many people in the world try to live in the middle. And I think that I can do what I want. That's freedom. That's really a false sense of freedom. Because if you do what you want, because we live in this, fle in this sinful flesh, in a sinful world, we're going to oftentimes sin. And so we're really under the yoke of slavery to sin if we think we can do whatever we want. But... If we've been set free and are slaves to Christ and are living for him, and as he lives through us by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's how we experience true freedom. And so this morning, we're going to explore what that means to really live free in Christ. And we'll begin by worshiping God, of course, and by giving him the glory and turning to him. And Paul says the entire Law is, is uh, summed up in one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's true. But you remember when Jesus said what, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. So it begins by loving God. And that's where we're going to begin here today. And Josie and Ben are going to, and uh, Carolyn are going to lead us here in... Uh, praising God and, and worshiping him. Hello. 
You guys can stand and we'll sing with God. spoke a word you were singing over me you had been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you had been so so No 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught. Thank you, Josie and Ben. That was great. <clears throat> I have a joy to share. Um, we rejoice with the Decker family. Uh, Bob and Sue are grandparents. <laughs> <clears throat> Yesterday morning, Lauren uh, gave birth to a son, uh, Maximilian Alexander Brown. So uh, I believe seven pounds and 90 ounces. Is that right? About 21 inches long. So um, congratulations to them and, and to Lauren and Ian. So praise God for that. Um, keep Dee in your prayers. She's been under the weather the last few days. Um, that's why when you came in, you didn't have a, a bulletin. Uh, she was. She had it mostly ready earlier in the week, but then she wasn't in Friday. She really was feeling quite sick Friday, Saturday. And uh, Kaylee said she's a little better now, but she still needs needs prayer. Uh, so uh, let's remember her and others that are in our hearts and minds uh, here today. As together we go to the Lord in prayer. Will you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we do come to you now. And we come to you in and because of your amazing grace. Lord, when we were lost, you found us. You sought us out, lost sheep. Lord, when we stumbled and fell, you were there to pick us up. Lord, when we sin, 
You call us to come and lay our sin down at the foot of the cross, to let go of that burden so that we might receive your forgiveness and love. And so we do that, Lord, right now. Any temptation that we're struggling with, we turn it over to you. Any burden that we bear right now, a, a heaviness, uh, a loss, a, a grief, a sin that we've committed and feeling guilty about, Lord, take that burden from us. As right now we come before you, we get real with you. We're honest, Lord. We don't try to hide anything, but we confess our sins and we lay our burden down right now. Hear, Lord, our personal and private prayers of confession. But Christ came to set us free so that we wouldn't have to bear the burden of sin anymore. If we are in Christ, if Christ has set us free, then we are free indeed. Help us not to surrender again to the yoke of slavery, but to live free in Christ, to live fully in his joy and hope in love. Lord, we pray not just for ourselves, but for others. Lord, we pray that you'd be with, uh, with Lauren and Ian and, and baby Max as they start this life together. We rejoice with them. Family, and just pray that you'd be with them moment by moment and day by day. It's really a miracle when a little one is born and we are in awe of how you fashioned that child in his mother's womb and now brought him into this world. We thank you for the new birth that's ours in Christ, that we who are dead in sin have been made alive in him. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that in Christ we can be born again and made new. We pray, Lord, for Dee, and we lift up all who are sick and pray for healing and wellness for them. Some people, Lord, are, are struggling with very serious illnesses. Of course, we're all concerned about COVID-19 and the coronavirus that just, Lord, it's not going away anytime soon. And we pray for healing for those who have been Infected by it, we pray, Lord, that there would be healing and wholeness and then an end to this virus. We know there's certain things we can do and help us to do that and be considerate of one another, but not give in to fear. But, Lord, to have faith in you. Even so, Lord, we pray for Jesus, the great physician, to touch us and to touch all those in need and be with those, Lord, who have lost loved ones as a result of this virus or other reasons. Comfort them in their time of loss and pain. We pray for our nation, Lord, where there is so much angst and so much division. We pray, Lord, on this Independence Day that you would help us as a nation to come together. We confess, Lord, that as a nation, too often we have turned away from you, tried to do it on our own. That doesn't work out ever. It's not working out now. We pray, Lord, that Revival would break forth in our hearts and in our nation and around the world. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Be with our church. Guide us during a time of transition and change. Provide, Lord, a clear way forward. 
Help us to know that we are yours, that we belong to you. We've been bought with a price and that you love us dearly, that you love Center Church, you love your body. May we love one another with the love that comes from you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, a lot of interesting things going on in our, our nation. Some things that are very disconcerting <laughs> and upsetting. You know, this past week there was a, a video that kind of spread pretty widely. Um, it was three young American girls. And they posted this video on the TikTok app, which is a video sharing app that a lot of young people like to use. They create little videos and then post it on TikTok. But in this particular video, these three young girls urge Americans not to wear red, white, and blue on the 4th of July. Now, the one girl said, America sucks right now. Honestly, if you support it and choose to wear red, white, and blue, it's disgusting and you shouldn't do it. And then another girl spoke up and said, yes, you're supporting Trump and racism. We don't want to see red, white, and blue in Independence Day posts. And then the third girl said, I want to see rainbow flags and rainbow sparkles. <laughs> and then the first girl said, caption your post, all countries matter. And that's true. All countries do matter. So one thing I really agreed with in the video but as you can see, I probably didn't heed their call. Now, at the risk of showing my belly button, look at this belt buckle. <laughs> kind of goes with this. Now, it may not be red, white, and blue, but it is stars and stripes. I think it's interesting as well that TikTok, that app that they shared the video on, is a Chinese company. Now, I, it makes you wonder, what would have happened if those girls were Chinese young people and they were calling for people in China not to wear yellow and red, the colors of the Chinese flag, on Chinese National Day, which is October 1st? Well, if what's going on in Hong Kong, where China is suppressing democracy and free speech, is any indication, I don't think it would have gone well for them. You know, one TikTok user responded to their video. I thought this was pretty good. They said, without that red, white, and blue, you wouldn't be able to wave that rainbow. Kind of profound, isn't it? America isn't perfect. We have our faults, and we're wrestling with some of those right now. And hopefully that will result in a better country, a, a country that's fair for all. But as we struggle with these issues, we got to be careful. We got to be careful that we don't make the mistake these young girls made. We can't forget that our nation is built on rights and values that very few countries have. And that many folks around the world would literally die for. Rights laid out in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <coughs> You know, as we celebrate Independence Day, our country is under attack. Sadly, it's under attack from within. Now, young people like these girls that are kind of naive <laughs> and post on social media things that kind of express their ignorance are symptomatic of the problem. 
it's kind of clear that somewhere along the way there were some gaps in what they were taught or how they were raised. They missed something along the way. But much worse is all the hatred and anger being expressed toward people who disagree. You know, if somebody disagrees with somebody else, then they belittle, belittle them, they disrespect them. Where's the mutual respect? In America, we had freedom of speech. But freedom of speech means that if you say it, somebody else might disagree with it. And we have to respect the fact that they may disagree, but we have to have some level of mutual respect for one another. And we're losing that. That's the scary part. You know, if we want equality for all and to be able to pursue happiness for ourselves, we've got, we've got to respect life and liberty in others, even if they disagree with us. And we don't have to agree with them. But we've got to respect the right to say, as long as what they're saying, you know, isn't something that is illegal or, you know, hateful. Listen, I have no problem with the peaceful protest. That's part of what, you know, we have that right in America. That's part of free speech. But violence and anarchy work against life and liberty in a pursuit of happiness. I don't know. I've never seen anything like this. I don't think we've ever really seen anything quite like this all the violence and unrest and anarchy that's going on. And we wonder, will it ever end? I mean, we may know, okay, eventually it's got to peter out at some point, but when it keeps going on? And we wonder, what can we do about it? We feel so weak and powerless. Do you ever feel that, do you feel that way? It's like, what can I do about it? Well, that's pretty much how Gideon felt in Judges 6. So if you have your Bible or want to follow along, it's in the sixth chapter of the book of Judges. The Israelites were oppressed. And the land was devastated by a people called the Midian, Midianites. And God called Gideon in the midst of that to save Israel from their enemy. The problem was he felt totally inadequate and unqualified for the task. If you look at Judges, that was weird. <laughs> okay, so I have this meditation app, this prayerful meditation app, and it just went off. <laughs> no, I'm not going to stop this and start meditating. <laughs> <clears throat> Technology, you got to love it. Anyway, so getting back to uh, Judges 6. Um, in verse 14, it says, The Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Okay. And Gideon replies, But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Why are you picking me? <laughs> Pick somebody else. I got nothing to offer here. Do you ever feel like Gideon? Do you ever feel like that? It's like, Lord, why are you picking me? Ever wondered how you can be used by God when you feel kind of weak and powerless yourself. You feel inadequate or unqualified for the task. That's what we're going to look at today, how we can be used by God when we feel that way, when we don't feel up to the task that he's calling us to do, which is like most every time. Let's pray and ask that God would speak to us through his word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do speak and are not silent. Help us to listen and to hear what you're saying to us. 
Lord, it's easy to hear words of comfort, but if we get convicted, yeah, that's not so easy. But help us to be good soil that receives your word. And like Gideon, ultimately overcomes our fears and worries and doubts and acts. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening in Jesus' name. Amen. So, how can we be used by God when we feel weak, powerless, inadequate, and unqualified for the task? Well, we can be used by God when we cry out to the Lord for help. It's recognizing, the first thing we need to do is recognize we don't have the strength. We don't have the ability to do anything for God without God's help. Now, look at verses uh, 1 to 6. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. That they were hiding, literally hiding for their lives. Sometimes that's our first reaction, right? When, when, when things get trouble, we just want to hide. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to deal with this. But a lot of times, the problems still find you out. <laughs> so whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the land. Uh, they camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels and invaded the land to ravage it. Now, we look at all of the destruction going on in our inner cities, and it's appalling to us. But imagine if that spread out to small towns and countries, and we were seeing all that in Grove City and all across the country. That's what it was like for them. That's how the country was being ravaged and devastated. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Help, Lord. You've got to cry out to the Lord for help. In the midst of what's going on in our lives, in the midst of going on in America, we need to cry out to the Lord for help. In Psalm 116, that's what the psalmist does. Listen to his cry to God for help. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. We can cry out to the Lord and help because we know that he hears and his mercy and love. That's why he sent his son, Jesus. That's why he sent prophet after prophet after prophet. He doesn't turn a deaf eye on our cry for help. Now, we may not always get the answer we want or expect or right at that moment, but he hears and responds. He's compassionate. We can be used by God when we start listening to God. Look at verses 7 to 10. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I did all this for you. I delivered you from slavery. I was there for you. I've always been there for you. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. Just don't worship the idols. Just remain true to me, but you have not listened to me. That's a problem. This mess you're in is, happens because you haven't listened to me. So often that's true in our lives, right? We kind of go our own way and don't really pay attention. Or we listen to other voices instead of the voice of God. 
just go along with the crowd. There's a lot of that going on today in, in America. Everybody believes this, so I'm just going to go along. We're afraid to buck what's going on, to go against the flow. But to be a Christian, that's kind of what it means. And we may be persecuted for it, but are we listening to God or are we listening to other voices? We can be used by God when we begin to see ourselves the way God sees us. A lot of times we're our own worst enemy. You know, we beat ourselves up. Now, I, I read earlier, Gideon didn't think much of himself. I'm the least of these. I'm from this little uh, clan, and, and I'm the least in my family. I'm nothing. But look how God looks at Gideon. Verses 11 and 12, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak and Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Okay, try and so we have a little food after they come and ravage the land. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> that's how God viewed him. As a mighty warrior. It's not how Gideon viewed himself, but that's how God viewed him. Now, how could God see him that way? Because God created him. And the Bible says that we're made in the image of God. God doesn't just see us for who we are or who we think we are, but he looks at who he created and that he declared good. He sees potential in us that we don't see in ourselves. He knows that we can become by his power and strength at work in and through us. We got to change our thinking. It's hard to be used by God and to really be effective if you keep beating yourself up and saying, I can't do it, I can't do it, I don't have that. Yeah, you don't have the strength. I don't have the strength. None of us do. But when the power of God at work in us, and as Christians, the, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and we have the power of God working in and through us to make us mighty warriors too. We can be used by God when we're open and honest with him. God does not like dishonesty and phoniness. Who did Jesus really rail against? Pharisees. Why? Because they were phony. They wanted to show everybody how great they were, how religious they were, but inside they weren't anything but that. And they didn't own up to that. God sees. There's no reason not to. Uh, Gideon was honest with God. If you look at verse 13... Uh, Lord, if you're with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all uh, his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now, the truth was they'd abandoned God by worshiping idols and turning away from him, but he was being honest with him. God's a big God. He can handle our honesty, right? He just wants us to be real with him. Whatever you're feeling, be honest with God. Be straight up with them. Have that kind of relationship. I mean, that's what we want and expect in our closest relationships, right? We don't want people who we love, our loved ones, to be dishonest with us or try to hide things. We want to be, have a, if you have a relationship where you can be honest with one another and speak the truth lovingly and, and caringly, that's what God wants. He wants us to be honest. And, and at least Gideon was honest with him. We can be used by God when we go in the strength that God gives us and do what he says. So in verse 14, the Lord, the Lord, and I read this verse earlier, turned to Gideon and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And then he goes on and he says, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my family. I don't have the strength. And he's right. None of us do, but am I not sending you? If God sends us, he's not going to send us to do something without going with us and without empowering us for that task. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alone. God doesn't focus on our weakness, but he knows his strength. There's nothing that can stand against him. 
And so if he goes with us, we can have a confidence we don't have. It's not confidence in ourselves so much as it's confidence in God going with us and working through us. It's kind of godly confidence, I think. We can be used by God when we risk offering ourselves to the Lord. Now, the first thing Gideon does in verse 17, he says, If I now have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. Give me a sign, Lord. Boy, we all want a sign, don't we? <laughs> Make it real clear. <clears throat> <clears throat> and so he asked for one. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Now, God wants us to act right away, but he can be patient. After all, a thousand years or as one year, a day to, to him, and a day is like a thousand years. He has like all eternity to wait. That doesn't mean he... We need to put him off, but you know, he can wait. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and, f and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared up from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you're not going to die. That's all through Scripture. We, people encounter God face to face or an angel, they're terrified. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm sinful. I don't deserve to be in your presence. No, no, it's okay. It's all good. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Bia's rites. All right, so he made this offering. This is a sign. And he said, and God... Gave him the sign. The angel touched the staff, whoa, consumed it, accepted the offering. Now, we're not going to kill goats and bulls and things like that because Christ is the perfect sacrifice and no other sacrifices are necessary anymore other than the sacrifice of ourselves. But we still need to give ourselves to God if we really want to be used by him, right? Offer ourselves to him. Use me, Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Give yourself fully to him. This is your true and proper worship. Now, how do we do that? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We offer ourselves by God, by living by his word and not conforming to the pattern of this world, letting him transform our mind and our lives, willing to go against the flow when everybody else is going one way. I'm willing to go the other way if that's not God's way that they're going. To give ourselves to the Lord and he can use us. And we need to get rid of our idols in our lives. Our idols are anything that is preventing us from giving ourselves fully to the Lord, that are getting in the way. Each person, that's going to be different for all of us, right? For some of us, it may be money. It could be desire to be known. It could be um, certain habits that are, we have to deal with, whatever. It could be anything that could become an idol. It gets in the way. And so Gideon had to deal with these things. Verse 25, that same night the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. That sounds very English to me. A proper kind of cult. Proper, you know. Uh, anyways, then he built a proper kind of altar uh, on the top of this height, on the top of that mountain, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than the daytime. It could be, you know, again, there may be pushback. 
townspeople, even his own family. There may be family members that push back. And you deal with that pressure. So he did it at night because he was afraid. Um, in the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. He did what he was told secretly, but he did it. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. That's how bad things had gotten. God's people who should have known better were worshiping Baal and were upset because Baal's altar got torn down. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? This is, again, Gideon's dad speaking. Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him should be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when, he, when someone breaks down his altar. If he's truly a god, let him defend himself, and let's see if he's really a god. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerubbaal, which means contend, contended with Baal, uh, that day saying, let Baal contend with him. You've got to get rid of anything that's getting in the way of being used by God. Get rid of the, the idols. And one more thing. If we're going to be used by God, we need to act in the power of the Holy Spirit and put our trust in God. Like I said, we don't have the strength, but God has all the strength we need. So, if, if you look at verses 33 and following, now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern Peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped at the Valley of Jezreel. They're going to overrun Israel once again. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. And he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizarites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet him. He was ready to go fight against the, the enemies, the Midianites. Almost ready, but not quite. Goes on and says to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, if you're going to do this, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Gideon's fleece, right? Okay. The ground's dry, which is not how you would normally expect it, but the fleece is wet. You think that was good. Okay, I know, God, you're with me. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me uh, one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. Let's do the opposite this time, God. You did that. Can you do the opposite? And at night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. God can do whatever God wills. If he desires it, he can make it happen. He can work miracles. He can work through us. He can do any way he wants. He's sovereign. He's in control. And we may struggle like Gideon to trust him, but ultimately Gideon did put his trust in him. And God did use him and delivered the people from the hand of the Midianites. You know the expression, dare to be a Daniel? You know, that's one that we hear in church a lot. Dare to be a Daniel, which is, which is great. Daniel was incredibly brave and courageous in the way he lived out his faith. He remained true to God even when it meant risking his life. And it did <laughs> when he was thrown into that lion's den. And I'll tell you, it would be great to be like Daniel. To have a strong faith like he had. That's certainly something we should all aspire to. But maybe you're not quite there. Maybe you don't feel quite as brave and confident as Daniel did. But that's true, and that's probably true of a lot of us, at least at times. Then go, go and be like Gideon. If you're a little overwhelmed with the thought of daring to be like Daniel. Go and be like Gideon. 
Any one of us can be like Gideon, but really without excuse. Think about it. If God can use Gideon to do some amazing things, even though he was so fearful and felt so weak and powerless and unqualified, if he can use someone like him, well, then there's no reason that he couldn't use us, people like you and me, right? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you did amazing things with Gideon, even though he struggled to believe, even though he didn't feel qualified. Lord, we can relate. We feel like that a lot. But Lord, help us. Help us to trust. Help us to know that you, you call people who feel weak and powerless all the time because that way, when you use us, all the glory goes to you because we know we couldn't do it on our own. It's only by your power that it can happen. And use us, Lord, to share your mercy and love, the grace and salvation of Jesus Christ with our friends and neighbors. Help us to not be afraid, but to be bold. Help us to trust that, Lord, you can use even the worst of situations, the things going on in our, our nation right now. You can use bad situations and, Lord, redeem them and make something good out of them. So, Lord, help us to trust you in this week to find one thing, one thing, one way that you can use us for your glory and to step out on faith and act on that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one way that uh, some of our folks live out their faith is through uh, Meals on Wheels. One of our uh, mission partners that we partner with and able to uh, bring hope and, and encouragement to uh, some older folks in our community. Yes, we provide meals, which is great. So that they, they have healthy meals. But I think just as importantly is the encouragement that somebody stops by and says hi and shows that they care for them. So we're going to learn a little bit more about that. Um, I'm going to ask Denise to come up and uh, can you turn this back on? Yeah. Thanks. Morning, everyone. Um, we have Jeannie Leo here. She's the kitchen coordinator for Meals on Wheels, and she's been involved for three years doing this um, very important job that she has and um, we appreciate you coming here today thank you very much we also have Sally Reed who's been involved with Meals on Wheels for many years and as well as Suzanne they're going to give their testimonials on or experiences they've had with being involved with Meals on Wheels so Jeannie thank you I was asked to share with you what I do in a typical day. Well, the first thing I do is say good morning to our cook, Terry. She has been with us for 25 years. I check the voicemail for messages as it could change the number of meals we are preparing for that day. And if so, I adjust things. I disinfect the tables and evenly space out the bags for the client's food to go into. I keep track of meals that the clients get every day in an Excel spreadsheet. If new clients are to start, I prepare for them. I won't bore you with all those details. <laughs> Around 10 o'clock, we fill the trays with the hot food, seal them, and they go in the oven until it's time for them to go out. 
Once the food is packaged in the bags, I check that they are all in the correct place. About 10.45, I take the hot meals out to the drivers. After all the meals are gone, it is time to prepare for the next day, which are lots of other details. After the drivers come back with the coolers, everything needs to be disinfected. If we receive payments or donations, I record them and make a copy of their check. If you'd like to volunteer, we could always use more drivers, packers, and substitute cooks. We are also always accepting new clients. If you have questions, I'll be available after the service. Thank you. <laughs> She's brought these brochures as well, so we'll have these in the back and in the, the other area where the pamphlets are. Of course, this one. Yeah. I need to be over here. I need to lean on things. Okay. I, um, let me, Jeannie does have a very important job. There's no two uh, ways about it. She uh, really runs the whole place, okay, with an iron, um, iron hand sometimes. She'll say, yes, you can, and no, you cannot. But she's a very special gal. We couldn't do it without her. I've been volunteering for Meals and Wheels probably for about 40 years. It was Dick's mother's idea in the first place, and then she bowed out after a while, and I just kept on going. Um, our route, uh, oh, uh, for about 30 years probably, I've been the Route 4 driver coordinator, and you all have been so gracious and helped out so many ways, and uh, we filled all the slots that we need to fill. Um, when I started, Kim and Kelly were quite young, and sometimes all you had to do was to show up with the kids. You didn't really have to bring the food. That was just kind of an extra thing. Uh, Kim has uh, helped me the whole way through high school. In fact, uh, sometimes we went, for a while we went in the afternoon. And so that's how she learned to drive, was delivering meals and meals. Um, we've had many drivers from center through the years, and um, some of them became clients later. Hazel Rouse drove, and she got meals and meals for a while, didn't she? Now we have a second generation, Bob and Suzanne are delivering. Um, and they go every Wednesday. They're a real blessing. And Suzanne is a packer, too. Virginia Riddle delivered for a while. Um, Polly and Lori Glenn delivered for a while. And then Polly became a client for a while. Dee and Kaylee Decker uh, delivered Meals and Wheels, and Kaylee was the youngest volunteer at that time. Um, Oh, we had John Thompson uh, delivering Meals and Wheels, and then his mother was, when his mother was on uh, getting uh, meals, and so on Mondays when John delivered, she just rode along with him, then they went home and had her lunch. We've had the Nusses, the Jules, Pat Hughes, Denise Skabinski, Carol Williamson, and she is retiring, and so Carol Herrick has very graciously accepted her spot. Now, Carol's been here from New England for a couple of years, and so I, to, on Tuesday, she's going, and I'm riding along and taking her into uncharted territory for her. So it's going to be, be interesting, but I appreciate her helping. Um, oh, when I was still working, there were times when I was having a really busy day, and I would get a call from either Jeannie or whoever was uh, the a coordinator at that time saying that somebody had not showed up. And I thought, oh, wow, how am I going to do this? And I say, Lord, I really don't have time for this today. But you know, um, I always was blessed by the, t by the time I got back. And sure enough, I got everything done that I had planned to do that day. Um, I didn't intend for this to be a recruiting <laughs> time, but um, you will be blessed as you bless others. So many thanks for all who have helped through the years. I'm not here to 
recruit anybody, but I'm just here to tell you that I pack on um, once a month, and I love it, and the food is delicious. If anybody's thinking about getting it or have it parents that need it, the food is amazing. You are definitely getting your money's worth when you pay for Meals on Wheels. And I, Bob and I drive every Wednesday, and I have gotten way more out of it than that I've ever gotten back. They are just wonderful people, and I love seeing them. They love seeing me, and I just think it's great. And so if anybody's coming up to retirement, you need some time to do something, it's definitely worth your while. Thank you. You and Bob, what a dynamic duo. Yeah. <laughs> if he's not making trouble, I am. <laughs> There's some quality family time there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is uh, one way that folks have found uh, to meaningfully give of their time and talents to the work of the Lord. Now we have the opportunity uh, to give part of our treasure, our financial resources to the work of the Lord. Again, we put them in the box out in the narthex. Um, but let's pray and ask that God would bless. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to give and be part of what you're doing in this world. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless the gifts that are given, multiply them 30, 60, 100 fold, so that, Lord, we can have tremendous impact for Christ in this community and around the world through our ministries. Ministries like Meals on Wheels, and we just pray that you would bless them in their work every day. And we thank you, Lord, for all those who have given up their time in that way, and if we learn that, that do so with joy in their hearts, but what hope and joy it brings. And we pray for the clients as well, often people who feel lonely and left out, but Lord, we thank you that uh, Meals on Wheels can reach out to them. And use us, Lord, as you use Gideon in the days to come. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I think Josie's got one more song for us. All right, please stand, and we're going to sing America the Beautiful a cappella. <laughs> oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. For purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed His grace on thee. <laughs> I told you America was not perfect. And we certainly are Americans and we're not perfect either. But we love God and we love to fellowship together in Christ. A um, couple of things to um, keep in mind. One, um, we are putting together a new members class. If there's, uh, I know there's a, been a request for that. And if you know anybody who'd like to be a part of that, um, please let me know, and we're going to be putting that together here in the next uh, week or so, I think, probably getting that off the ground. Um, we have a brief meet, a deacon's meeting at the church. 
Okay, there'll be a brief deacons meeting after the church. Um, so there's that going on. Uh, we're going to start something here today. Um, some of us were talking um, with all the things that are transition going on in our church, you know, and in a time of, of uh, transition and change and, and what's going on in our nation. You can never pray too much, right? And we really want to lift up prayer. And so the idea was to close our time together with a special time of prayer. Um, so I'm going to ask Ray Benedict to come forward. Um, he's going to lead us in this time of prayer. Now, if you want, again, wherever you're comfortable with at this point in time, if you want to make a, a big circle, we can do that. If you want to stay where you are, that's fine too. I don't want to make anyone uneasy. Um, but here's, Ray's going to lead us in a time of prayer. It's not the longest cord in the world. Thank you. Okay, good morning, family. And just so everybody understands, I agreed with Pastor to do to lead this this week, but every week somebody different will be leading it. Those of you that are interested, let Pastor or let D know. Let's start with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> Kingdom come, thy will be done. <clears throat> this is this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's start with, again, going through the Lord's Prayer. But let's take it section by section. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let's spend a bit of time thinking about God's majesty and how that's important to us. In thinking about God's majesty, let's think about what he's calling us to do as an individual, as a church family, and within our country. When we ask God to give us our daily bread and to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, what does that mean? What are we individually called to do? And what are we as a church called to do? In order to do that, are we open to letting the Holy Spirit enter into us and give us guidance? And again, what is the Holy Spirit guiding us to do?
And we, when we say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Once again, we need to think about God's majesty and that kingdom and what part of it in it do we play and do we have the strength and the willingness to be that part. And in closing, let's say the Lord's Prayer again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. And we would encourage you as we go through today and go through the week to spend time in prayer and to really wrestle with what we're being called to do as an individual and as a church family. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, as you go out into the world, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace. Amen.